Now, it's Palm Sunday, and we're in Leviticus. And as somebody was kind enough to point out this morning, um, is there any way you can tie Leviticus 16 into um, Palm Sunday? Well, this message is not geared towards Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entry. So if you want that, it's on YouTube. Last year, you can look it up under the triumphal entry of the king or, or the arrival of the king. But I hope we understand that the Day of Atonement is not all that detached from Palm Sunday and the events that follow for Passion Week. In fact, if you look with me at Matthew's Gospel in chapter 21, you'll notice that immediately following the triumphal entry is what? The cleansing of the temple, which is the context, the very context of which Leviticus 16 finds itself. And, you know, and the Day of Atonement. Recall that due to Nadab and Abihu's unauthorized um, offering, their unauthorized sacrifice in the temple defiled both the tabernacle and the priesthood. Leviticus 16 was put in place as a temporary resolution for this defilement, this pollution, we might say. But as we saw last week, this entire sacrificial system was somewhat deficient. I say somewhat deficient. It was deficient to a point. It was deficient to truly atone for sin and the pollution sin causes. But what it was not deficient to do was to point to the day when God would deal with and atone for sin once and for all in the work and person of his son. So jumping back to Palm Sunday, while Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, the crowds are spreading not just their coats, they're spreading leafy palm branches before him, and they are shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, many of you might know, the crowd is quoting Psalm 118, which we opened our service with in our call to worship. The very next verse of Psalm 118 is about binding the festal or festival sacrifice to the altar. Why? Because it's through the festival sacrifices that God has provided atonement for sin. And Jesus comes as a sacrifice to which all other sacrifices pointed, including those offered on the Day of Atonement. And even the Article 21 of the Belgic Confession, which we read earlier, is actually titled The Atonement. So I hope you're starting to grasp just how central this event of the Atonement is. Last week, we looked at the priest's need to first atone for his own sin before he could do so for the people. We also looked at atonement at the very basic level under the idea of covering. Uh, atonement covers over the trespasses of our sin, the trespasses of one party. And atonement also covers the justified wrath that such trespasses deserve. So, this atonement deals with covering both our sin and God's just wrath. So today, we're looking more directly now at how Leviticus 16 deals with atonement for the people, atonement for the congregation. And we're going to look at that by two ways. We're going to look at it through two goats and their opposite trajectories, and we're also going to deal with this concept um, of the concepts of propitiation and expiation. I'll, I'll try to define those as we go and how these two goats uh, deal with each, address both. So I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to stand again. I know we just stood for Eli's reading. I'm going to ask you to stand again as I read from Leviticus chapter 16, 
just going to read four verses, beginning at verse 7. Then Aaron, he, Aaron shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord. And use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. And now, a brief prayer. Father, we ask that you would illuminate your word for us this morning, that we might have eyes to see and ears to hear and that we might be transformed because of it, and your Son might be glorified all the more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I wonder what Charlie, just the name of some guy who likely lives down the street, thinks about Leviticus and this whole sacrificial offering and system, and especially the Day of Atonement. It's Sunday, and Charlie happens to just happen to sleep in today. You know, he works a job where he has the weekends off, and later he will probably mow the grass and watch a little bit of March Madness. But I doubt that Charlie is thinking about Leviticus at all, and perhaps many who just happened to be in churches this morning, they aren't thinking about it either. You see, our culture, and this is the reason why, our culture tends to think that it is a small thing to enter into God's presence. Being a God of love, God just naturally accepts everyone. He's automatically pleased with you because he made you. Well, we know that is how most people tend to think because if you go to any given funeral, you're likely going to hear conversations to this effect. Well, Aunt Sally, she's in a better place now. Or Bob, I bet he is playing the round of his life today. Or Miss Betty, she no longer has to suffer through that cancer. Regardless of whether or not they had any relationship with God, much less a relationship with Jesus. That's the conversation in most funerals. It's assumed by most, at least verbally, that if there is a heaven, everyone is going. And when they get there, they will be doing whatever their favorite activity was here on earth. So when Charlie and the rest of the world and even many who fill churches this morning come across such an elaborate system of sacrifices to deal with sin, not to mention the hundred of laws recorded right here in Leviticus, they scoff what God would ever command or devise such jumping through hoops to appease him. And if there is such a God who requires such jumping through hoops, then he certainly doesn't deserve my attention, much less my respect or my affection. Such an attitude, again, is because they think it a light thing to come before a holy God if they give any thought to God at all. But let me just put it out there, just in case any of you wrestle with this. If it is such a small thing to come before God, then why did Jesus have to die on a bloody, gruesome cross? That's where our two goats come into play. And these terms, expiation and propitiation. Expiation, it has to do with removal. You can see it in the prefix ex. You know, we have, oh no, Steve, we don't have them in here. We have exit signs, meaning this is the way out, out from. So 
Expiation is the removal of sin away from God. We can't come into God's holy presence with our sin. God is too pure. You and I would be disintegrated. Our sin must be cleansed. It must be completely removed. And then there's propitiation. The prefix pro meaning for. It has to do with the assuaging or the placating of God's righteous wrath, making God no longer against you, but for you. Now, if we merely think of sin as making a mistake, then none of this makes any sense whatsoever. How could God be so incensed by a mere mistake? You talk about someone who has a serious issue with temper and patience, but sin isn't a mistake at all. Sin is blatant rebellion. It's treason. Sin is a willful act to overthrow God's order and thus his kingdom. And because he is loving and righteous, he better be angry about it. You know, a father who doesn't get angry about someone deliberately mistreating his kids is a sorry excuse for a father. Don't tell me that such a father is loving. Well, God, our Heavenly Father, by no means will turn a blind eye to such behavior because he is indeed loving. He loves his children and he is just. So back to our goats. Notice in Leviticus 16 verse 7 that both goats... They begin at the entrance of the tent of meeting. That's significant, and we'll return to it. Then in verse 8, Aaron casts lots over them to determine which goat is for the Lord and which is to be sent away into the wilderness. First, what's the purpose of casting lots? Casting lots, for those who don't know, is a type of rolling dice. We were playing a board game last night, uh, Settlers of Catan, and we had to keep rolling the dice, and it just never landed on the number I wanted. Well, in our case, with the two goats, most are probably thinking, if the one who gets to go first is the one that gets slaughtered, I'll pass. You know, let you, you roll the dice in your favor. Let the other one go first. We often think of casting lots as leaving something up to random chance. The Bible in Ecclesiastes does say that time and chance happens to all. But the same author, the same book in Ecclesiastes makes it clear that such random chance is not outside of God's sovereignty. In fact, it says there's a time for every season appointed under heaven. So whatever time and chance may mean, they don't stand outside God's sovereign purpose. Even in Proverbs, we read that the lot is cast into the, the lot uh, into the lap. But what? It's every decision is from the Lord. So this entire purpose for casting lots, of which the priests would pull out their specially consecrated pair of dice, the Urim and the Thummim, was to determine. God's will in the matter. So casting lots for these goats was to get God's answer as to which goat was to be for the Lord and which one would be sent away. There was nothing in the goats themselves to distinguish one from the other. Only God's sovereign purpose. Hold on to that. We'll return to it. The first goat to which the lot fell, would be presented as a sin offering for the people. If we jump down to verse 15 and following, the blood of that goat was brought inside the veil to the most holy place. And that blood would be sprinkled on and before the face of the mercy seat. The blood would also be sprinkled on the tent of meeting itself. And it would be taken outside and sprinkled on the four horns of the altar. So what does this first goat have to do with expiation and propitiation? Well, for one, the blood is used for cleansing. 
if we turn to chapter to chapter 17 verse 11 we're also told that the it's the blood that makes atonement for one's soul so there's something at least symbolic about the blood of the ato- blood of an innocent substitute being used to cleanse the guilty sinner that's expiation it removes it cleanses sin away but also because the wages of sin is what Death, justice has now been done. And God's wrath has been satisfied. That's propitiation. God's righteous disposition is no longer against but for the sinner because the penalty has already been dealt with. So what about the second goat? Well, he got to go free, right? Well, perhaps. But more likely there's something else going on here. To get a better picture of what that is, let's look at verses 21 and 22. Let me find it. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of the of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote, or we might say a cut-off area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Now, the ESV likely does not do the best job of capturing the end of verse 22, stating that this goat shall go free. While that word can mean to to let go free, such as let my people go, um, it's likely better translated, and he shall send the goat into the wilderness. The second goat isn't set free so much as it is sent away. He is sent away. We can better understand this by considering the major themes of the Bible storyline, which we have sought to do in our Wednesday night classes. Look back at verse 7. Where do these goats begin? Where do they start out? At the entrance of the tabernacle. Now, if we were to back up to Genesis chapter 3, after they send, what happened to Adam and Eve? They were removed from the garden sanctuary to outside the sanctuary. And if you remember which way they're they're removed to the east, cherubim guarded the east. And if you remember which way the sanctuary, the the tabernacle faced, it faced toward the east. I guess this would be your east, huh? It would face towards the east. And entrance back into the tabernacle would be a westward trajectory. So in Genesis 4, we find that Cain and Abel were likely still bringing their sacrifices to the door or to the entrance of this garden sanctuary. But they could go no further because of the cherubim who guarded the entrance. And then after Cain rose up and killed Abel, he ended up even further east of the garden. Further east into the barren wilderness. Well, that is exactly what's going on with these two goats. They are on opposite trajectories. They both begin at the entrance of the tabernacle. But the first goat enters by its blood into the very presence of God. The second goat, loaded down with the sins of the people, is driven further into exile, further east into an uninhabited, cut-off land, a land cut off from God, cut off from God's people. Cut off completely from God's presence and all the blessings that come with such. Do you know what such a place is? It's hell. Hell is absolute exile from God. Those living apart from God right now have no clue just how horrifying complete exile will be. 
So how does this goat affect propitiation and expiation? Well, similar to the first goat, the second goat bears the penalty sin deserves. But in a fuller sense. And I hope you realize that physical death was not the full payment of sin. Physical death was not the full penalty for sin. God told Adam that on the day he ate from the tree, what would happen? He would surely die. Or more literally, he would die, die. How was that penalty enacted? It was enacted because Adam was exiled from God's presence. That was death. More than the physical death, that was death. Adam was removed from God's immediate presence. But in God's mercy and grace, Adam didn't receive the fullness of the penalty he deserved. He was only moved just outside the garden sanctuary. Yes, physical death is part of it. But physical death is nothing compared to what Revelation refers to as the second death. So God's wrath is portrayed as being satisfied in this goat's complete exile. But the second goat didn't just receive the punishment of the exile. It symbolically removed the people's sin by carrying away their sins. That's expiation. When this goat went into exile, it carried away the people's sin with it. As far as the east is from the west, that is Psalm 103. Psalm 103 points back to the Day of Atonement, but it also points forward to what our Lord will accomplish on the cross. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. That's what Jesus accomplishes on the cross, satisfying the wrath of God towards sin and completely removing our sin from before God's face. It's symbolized in the stretching out of his hands on the cross, but it's actualized in his father turning his back on his very son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus endures the fullness of the exile you and I deserve. And in doing so, he carries our sins away completely. So if you're in Christ, when God looks on you, he no longer sees sin. He sees Christ in you. Your sin has been removed. But there are two things that must be said regarding this. First, you must truly be in Christ. So that's the question. Are you in Christ? Is it evident in your life? Are you bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Because this removal of sin and satisfaction of God's wrath towards sin is only for those who are in Christ Jesus. who come in recognition that they not only need to be cleansed from their sin, but that God's wrath needs to be turned away from them. If you are among the camp that still thinks it's a light thing to come before a holy God, it is very likely that you are not in Christ. The Bible is quite clear on God's stance towards sin. And get this, God doesn't throw the sin into hell. He throws the sinner into hell. Jesus opened wide his arms, inviting you to receive his payment in your place. So that you need not be utterly exiled from God's presence for all eternity. Hopefully, everyone in here is in Christ. Second, while God doesn't look on you and your sin, it is understood that you and I, even though we are in Christ, 
we still sin and we still need to be conformed into Christ's image. We are to progressively move toward the image of Jesus. The image that God already sees in us in Christ. As Paul says in Colossians, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Now put to death. Put to death what is earthly in you. You have died. Now put to death. In other words, you and I need to start genuinely looking like we truly are in Jesus. Sanctification is not optional for the believer. The Day of Atonement. It was marked not only by the sacrifices God himself provided, but there was to be a response from the people. Verse 30, it was to be a day of solemn rest and afflicting oneself, or we might say denying oneself, likely in the form of fasting. The first of half of this response was to be a solemn remembrance of the sin that required the Lord to go through such links. So whatever it looks like, at the very least, it suggests that we should have a regular, we should have regular occasions where we enter a time of confession and we mourn over our sin and the sins of others. The other half of the response is that of dying to self. Whether that means a regular practice of fasting, I don't know. But what I do know is that the only way your life is hidden with Christ in God is if you have died to self. Meaning you are no longer living for you. You are living for Christ. But the Day of Atonement, it was not a stand-alone event. Celebration always followed. If we jump to chapter 23, we find that the Day of Atonement took place on the 10th day of the 7th month. Then beginning on the 5th day, 15th day of the same month, there was a Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 40 reads as follows. You shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. That should remind us of something. You see, while Palm Sunday took place immediately before Passover, Jesus' triumphal entry cried out. It screamed that the day of atonement has come. Not only had the Messianic king arrived, but so too our great high priest. He had come to make the once for all sacrifice for sin. But he wasn't bringing in bulls and goats. He was coming as the lamb, offering up his own body. As high priest, he would carry his own blood through the veil of the true tent in order to secure eternal redemption for you and me. And, for, and as the man in readiness, he carries away our sin as far as the east is from the west. And for that, you and I celebrate. I mentioned at the beginning how some look at this elaborate sacrificial system and see it as nothing but an unnecessary hoops to have to jump through in order to appease God. Well, there's no elaborate set of hoops you and I must jump through. Only a door. And there's no jumping. This door is set in the lowest place of all, in the valley of humiliation. This door is nothing other than the entrance to a grave, the grave where our Lord Jesus, our Savior, was laid. You enter into Christ, you enter into his death. <clears throat> 
There were two goats for which lots were cast. The one entered into God's holy presence, but to do so, it had to die. The other was sent into permanent exile, loaded down under the tremendous weight of sin, never to come into God's presence again. That exile is nothing short of hell. Let me ask, which goat are you? To enter God's presence, you must die with Christ and die to sin. Sadly, most will choose exile before dying to themselves. Lots were cast. There was nothing to distinguish that made one goat more acceptable over the other. Just as there is nothing in you that makes you more or less acceptable to God. Your sins aren't greater and your sins aren't any less. Lots were cast. There was nothing to differentiate one goat from the next except this one thing. One goat died. The other wandered. Your response will show which one are you. Die with Christ. Enter through the door of Christ. Enter through his death. I plead with you. Let us pray. Lord, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Rather than cleaving to you, we cleave to our very lives. We cleave to our agendas. We cleave to the plans we have for ourselves. We cleave to making our own name great. Failing to realize that such leads us into a trajectory further and further away from you. But you put before us the way of life and death. All of the great paradox that to die is to live. Because apart from Christ, we are dead to you. But to die with Christ is to live before you, to live in your holy presence and to enjoy the sweetest of all fellowships. Move our hearts. Stir our affections for you. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.